uh, one thing I've learned in the 10 years since I've been here is not to agree to give more than one talk on two different topics within two weeks of um, <laughs> each other. And so I had to give a talk about uh, a week and a half ago on non-Gaussian uh, spatial models. So uh, this is why I'm talking about this particular topic. But upon uh, further reflection, I think um, some of the uh, motivation behind some of this work, how I got interested in, actually fits in really well um, with um, my experience here um, at Duke. And so I thought I'd start off by talking a little bit about that. Um, but just to uh, provide some context, um, this is uh, my class, um, the entering class of, of 1999. Um, I believe at the time it was the largest class of um, uh, in the PhD program here at Duke. And I was thinking about calling these people my academic siblings, but then I realized that might not sound so good since I married one of them. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I guess there's another uh, married couple in here as well. But uh, just people who are here, and Enrique um, is, is over here, and then Chris is over here. And I don't, we all look much younger than <laughs> we were back then. Um, so, so thinking back to this time when I, when I came here uh, to Duke, um, you know, I can't help but but remember have fond memories of of um, hanging out with not just the people in this class, but with the the faculty and, and other students. And so, um, the only two other photos that I can find um, uh, were were of some birthday parties at uh, Torreros and um, clearly I was enjoying myself at both of these occasions. Uh, and I don't remember what we were doing here. It was something like whipped cream on people's noses. It was Marco's birthday. Yeah, it was Marco and, and Enrique's Bruce birthday here. With the, with with the, with the cake. But Enrique has it here, so I don't know. Uh, uh, anyway, so edge of beard here, Marco. Um, and a bunch of uh, other people from Monica's uh, here as well. Okay, so um, kind of moving on to to the development of uh, of my research program and uh, kind of becoming uh, a Bayesian statistician. Um, I was thinking back to to some of my um, uh, earliest experiences uh, learning about Bayesian statistics, and, and um, because uh, um, I had recently been reading this paper um, with a couple of my own students. It, it um, made me think of, of a reading course that I did my first year here with, with Michael Levine. And um, in typical Michael Levine uh, fashion, he, he um, was really excited about a paper and, and a data set and, and you know, ask around who was interested in talking about with them, and, and um, I was uh, quick to volunteer. So uh, this paper, I would imagine a lot of you are familiar with it. Um, it appeared in JRSSC in, in uh, 1998, so a year before uh, I uh, came to Duke. And, and basically what the paper is about is um, uh, kind of uh, fully Bayesian models for uh, non-Gaussian uh, spatial data. The idea is you just take a um, standard generalized linear model and introduce a, um, a spatial stochastic process um, to, to account for the uh, dependencies. And so this is just um, basically a generalized linear mixed model. Today um, is probably not something that, that anyone would consider that special, but at the time I think was kind of um, at least one of the first times I really appreciated um, the beauty of Bayesian statistical modeling while I was trying to um, digest uh, the more classical uh, spatial statistics li literature with all different types of, of Kriging equations, etc. Um, but probably the most interesting thing about this paper was the discussion. So it had 28 separate contributions uh, uh, to the discussion. And um, they're mostly all interesting uh, for a variety of different regions. So some of them, here's an example of a, a positive one about the flexibility of Bayesian modeling, et cetera. Um, some of them were uh, 
negative, but but in a constructive way. Um, so, um, if you're familiar with it, with the uh, discussions of this paper, Michael Stein has a raises the issue of of using a Gaussian correlation function, which everyone in spatial statistics now knows you absolutely should not do. Um, and um, Tony O'Hagan uh, talked about uh, using uniform priors uh, on some of the model parameters, um, et cetera. So, so those were, were very interesting. And um, some of the other ones were extremely negative and um, very eye-opening to me as a first-year student who didn't fully appreciate um, uh, the uh, general perceptions of Bayesian statistics uh, at the time. And, and so I remember kind of thinking, what have I got myself into here? Um, I thought I was just going to graduate school in, in statistics. And kind of reflecting on this, how, how uh, completely ridiculous statements are like that um, to most of us now, it's kind of hard to believe that that was only uh, 13 years ago. Okay, so this talk. Um, so. So a lot of the ideas, especially the ideas that, that people discussed um, in, in their contributions to, to uh, the discussion part of this paper, I think are still very relevant today in spatial statistics. Um, some of these are uh, the issues of inference on uh, model parameters versus prediction in the spatial uh, setting. Um, there is... Um, it's difference between directly and indirectly specified spatial dependent structures is, is somewhat articulated in the discussion and I think is very relevant for what I'm going to be talking about. And then likelihood identifiability prior specification. Um, these are also kind of common themes of, of the discussion and are relevant um, uh, to the work that I'm presenting. Okay. Um, so I don't think I mentioned it at the beginning, but I should. So this is joint work with uh, my former PhD student, Candace Barrett, who's now an assistant professor at Brigham Young University. And um, uh, for a long time, probably five or six years, I was involved in a collaborative project um, for which Candace was a GRA, um, where we were working with uh, some geographers at Ohio State, um, looking at the relationship between um, biomass burning and the black carbon uh, aerosols in the atmosphere. And um, it's, the relationship is quite complicated, especially in uh, Southeast Asia where um, a large percentage of the biomass burning aerosols um, are a result of a common agricultural practice uh, known as Swidden agriculture where land is cleared uh, through burning. Um, so, so in this area of the world, um, um, uh, a large amount of, of the air pollution generally is, is, a ca is caused by um, kind of an ever-changing uh, uh, distribution of, of land cover um, across a very wide geographic uh, region. Um, so so in, in this work, I'm not going to actually talk any, or say anything about uh, the aerosols, although that was probably what we focused on the m most, but um, more interested in, in modeling the actual land cover data itself. And, and the motivation uh, for this was really that, that in order to be able to look at uh, land cover uh, distributions and aerosols, we needed... Um, or it was going to be much easier if we had complete land cover data. And, and while that's uh, feasible now, some of the historical records, we had large amounts uh, of missing data. And we were interested in um, basically being able to fill in um, the gaps in, in the historical data. Um, so, so this led us to, to look into uh, uh, models for multi-category or polychotomous uh, uh, spatial data. Um, some of the methods that, that are available are indicator creating, which is um, known to have a wide variety of problems, autologistic models, um, spatial generalized linear models, and spatial generalized linear mix models. And, and what I'm going to focus on is, is the spatial generalized linear mix model. 
Okay. So I feel a little bit silly uh, having this uh, slide for, for this audience. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the Albert and Shib uh, latent variable uh, representation of the multinomial probit uh, regression model. Um, but to just introduce my notation, uh, yi is our um, categorical response variable, and we relate that um, to uh, latent variable z, um, uh, which are assumed uh, to have a multivariate normal distribution, where in the top, uh, in a traditional uh, framework, we assume independence across the, the individuals, across the i in, in this uh, notation. And there are several uh, well-known um, identifiability uh, problems uh, with this model, so it is a standard practice to to rewrite the model in terms of uh, differences, so the difference between the latent uh, Z for each category and a base um, or a pivot uh, category. So we do that here. And um, um, in addition, there's uh, scale identifiability, and the typical constraint that, that is placed is to assume that the 1-1 one, one element of the um, cross-category covariance matrix is equal to 1. So um, uh, model fitting is, is widely recognized to be um, um, uh, much more convenient in, in with this latent variables uh, specification. Um, there's been more recent work on data augmentation strategies, um, basically relaxing um, or playing around with the restriction on the cross-category covariance matrix to improve uh, mixing of MCMC algorithms. And Candace and I worked on that um, in the spatial setting um, and uh, but in general uh, one of the nice things about the probit uh, latent variable representation is that it's really straightforward using tools that that are common in spatial statistics to introduce uh, dependence across the individuals in our case the individuals are our spatial locations um, so the idea is to uh, replace um, the covariance of the latent use with a um, with the matrix sigma, which captures the cross category, cross space uh, covariance. Um, one thing that again is probably not necessary to point out to this audience, but this isn't a generalized linear mixed model. The dependence um, between the um, the observations y is directly modeled uh, through through this sigma and. In, in some ways, you can think of uh, this particular model as a special case of Chip and Greenberg's multi-category, multivariate probit regression model, although it's a very special case in which the, the number of observations is one, if you're thinking um, about the, uh, the multivariate uh, generalization. Okay. So, so structures for uh, sigma, there's all different uh, ways you could think about modeling uh, uh, sigma. So um, some of the places that are borrowing some of the, the ideas for multivariate spatial modeling, so the multivariate conditional autoregressive model. Um, there's some examples of multivariate simultaneous autoregressive models. And um, some of the, the multivariate Gaussian process models, like the, the linear model of co-regionalization that, that Alan has, has worked on. So all of these kind of provide um, tools for, for specifying the um, prior dependence structure between categories and how it varies across space. Um, so in the literature, there this is not something that is new um, by any means. So Victor Golovera uh, worked on this um, in 2000, has a paper on it. Um, there's been some work by Jennifer Hoding and others on, on basically versions of this model for uh, ordinal categorical data. Um, and some very recent work on, on the multi-category situation, which is what I'm uh, considering here. And um, uh, kind of interestingly, the, the motivating application in all of uh, these multi-category versions of the model is, is understanding land use, land cover change. Okay. Um, so, so when Candace and I got into to working with... Um, yeah, so, so is, is it fundamentally different from like Gaussian process classification models? Or, uh, 
Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about that in a minute. That that essentially what we're doing here is 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 you you can think of it as a classification model. Okay, so when land use is just a single land use, you know, they have like grid boxes that are have multiple uses and you know proportions of different land use classification. No, so 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 what we have is is. Um, it is gridded data, but there's a single land use. Um, so a lot of it is actually historical data. So and and the land cover in this region of the world does change pretty uh, quickly. So so we do just have um, this piece of land is forest, cropland, um, urban, etc. Yeah. Um, certainly, for more of the temporary land cover data, um, you would have have kind of distributions and land cover types within um, So some limitations of, of the uh, multi-category uh, probit model uh, that are, are fairly widely known, although I certainly wasn't um, aware of it um, towards the beginning, is issues with parameter uh, non-identifiability, which I think is kind of well understood. Um, but but there's also uh, major concerns with weak identifiability, um, meaning that there's very little information in the likelihood about some of the parameters um, in the model. And this can be particularly problematic when you're considering um, more complex specifications of the um, prior uh, cross-space um, category covariant structure. So just to, to illustrate this, if you consider the, the non-spatial trinomial probit model, um, so you have three uh, categories and you rank the model in terms of two uh, latent um, processes U. Um, we have a mean that uh, depends on um, parameters beta 1 and beta 2 and then three um, parameters in, in the covariance. And being that Dave Higdon was officially my advisor. I um, kind of have, have slowly learned um, from him the importance of trying to explain things in pictures. And, and I'll admit that I'm still kind of new to, to doing this. But, but I think, for me, this helps in terms of, of better understanding um, this weak identifiability issue. So here in this plot, I have um, Z1 uh, versus Z2. And this uh, blue dot is the uh, center of the uh, latent uh, Gaussian distribution um, that gives us the, the category probabilities. Um, and the, the circle here is um, the 95% contour of, the, um, of a uh, circular um, normal distribution centered at, at this block. And, um, these different uh, colored regions um, of, of the graph um, denote kind of how the truncation works in terms of determining the uh, category probabilities. So the, in some sense, the area um, under the uh, bivariate normal distribution in this light uh, gray area is the, the probability um, of, of um, observing uh, yi to be in the, the first category. And so the, these probabilities, which are areas under these um, normal distribution, are along the left here. And so this is how things uh, work when, when you just have a model with an intercept. Um, and um, you can see from this picture easily why this, non, uh, this model with just a, a single intercept um, is, is non-identifiable. And the reason is because you have um, very high posterior uh, correlation between the um, intercept parameter and the parameters of the covariance function. So this um, ellipse here um, is centered um, up here and, and is obviously very different looking uh, than, than the solid, um, uh, solid circle here. Both of these up to two decimal places result in the same probabilities of the different categories. So there's no way from, from data um, that you could distinguish this bivariate um, normal distribution from, from this one. And um, if you're interested in 
in making marginal inferences on, on parameters in these models, it's basically not going to be feasible uh, with an intersect. Um, when you have uh, continuous covariance in the model, uh, things become a little bit better. Um, so that's what I'm um, attempting to show here. So here we have a uh, covariate that takes values negative 1, 0, and 1. And um, uh, these uh, different ellipses are consistent with these different values of, of the covariate. For the dark blue one, that's the same ellipse as I had in, in the previous graph. So we know that uh, this dashed ellipse and the solid blue one result in the same uh, category probabilities. But um, um, if we think about shifting uh, this ellipse along this, this red line um, here, there's no way to get um, the, the marginal probabilities of the different categories um, um, to work out with this, with this other ellipse. So you start to be able to identify um, parameters of the covariance function when you actually have more information in, in your, your covariates. Um, so, so multiple ex explanatory variables in some ways help in terms of the identifiability um, problem, but, but any issues with collinearity um, can, can re result in some, some major uh, uh, problems with weak identifiability. Um, this, is, this problem becomes uh, more and more an issue once you uh, move to, to more complicated uh, covariance structures uh, for the, the latent process. In fact, um, in a lot of cases, you're not going to be able to identify uh, uh, the parameters of these models. Um, so of course, the implications of this are that, that um, uh, the, the inferences on, on the regression coefficients may be unreliable, and, and uh, model fitting algorithms can be uh, very unstable. And um, so, so I think in any case when you're going to, to use these models and you care about inferences on, on the regression parameters, um, you have to be very careful that you actually are identifying um, something that's real. Because I think in most cases, uh, you're probably not. Um, so, so more recent work is focused on using this model for um, uh, classification purposes, which is actually pretty much what we want to do here. Um, in that setting, this identifiability um, problems are not going to be as much of an issue. Um, and I think uh, I won't go through all of this, but basically we set um, up a, a classifier um, based on the posterior predictive distribution um, from this model. And um, in, in our situation, uh, we have found that it works um, fairly well. Uh, so this is a particular example of land cover data in, in Southeast Asia. Um, some covariates that, that we have here are elevation, uh, distance to the coast, distance to the nearest big city, um, and distance to the uh, nearest major road, all of which you might imagine um, are are um, related to, to uh, land cover uh, type. And so uh, just a quick illustration of one of our simulation studies. Um, here we have uh, four categories and four covariates. Um, we have uh, 450 observations uh, and 400, or 47 were left out for um, cross-validation purposes. And we look at the test error compare the spatial multinomial probit model with the regular multinomial probit model, um, and we see um, improvement. And, and that's not surprising. This is highly spatially dependent uh, data. We also compared um, the spatial multinomial probit model to uh, two versions of k-nearest neighbors, um, one based on distance and covariate space, and one based on distance in geographic space. and um, of course, kind of depending on, on the particular run of, of the algorithm, uh, we can get uh, different numbers. But um, essentially, uh, we do a little bit better. Okay. So, so I will finish up here. Um, I just thought it would be appropriate to uh, 
uh, thank a variety of people in the, this department, many of whom are in this room. So certainly um, to all of the faculty who have done so much for me um, um, over the years. Um, to two alums who are here who I wanted to point out just because um, they, they have been um, particularly helpful to me as, as a student, but then also as I've moved on in my career, um, being wonderful mentors, so Janice Swell and uh, Herbie Lee, who was, was a, a postdoc during uh, my time as a graduate student. Um, and then lastly, just a little bit of an advertisement, so, so there is a pretty good contingent of, uh, of Dukies in the Statistics Department at Ohio State, and we would love to have more. So if you are looking for a job this year, we have four positions, and I encourage you to apply. Um, for a couple of questions, Patricia. How is the mixing? Um, so, so, um, yeah, it, it, well, so let me think about how to answer that. So, um, <laughs> so, um, we use this um, partially collapsed um, data augmentation algorithm that, that Candace and I worked on with, with, a, with the um, binary spatial COVID uh, regression model. And, and that helps to some extent, um, but certainly uh, mixing is going to be an issue with these, these highly uh, dependent parameters. So it's, it's not great, but, I, but um, at least for this size, I think it's manageable, I guess. Yeah. Um, do you ever do anything like variable selection or model choice for these sorts of models? Um, yeah, so, so um, but not in a very elegant manner. So certainly um, we want to work with, with um, covariates that, that are um, not highly collinear because we know we're not going to be able to identify things. Um, so in some ways, it's kind of pre-analysis, but we've never done anything formal in terms of, of um, model selection, although that might not be totally true now that I think about it. So um, I'm having kind of trouble remembering the various uh, steps of our analysis, but, but um, um, I think a little bit in terms of, of regression, uh, in terms of the, the uh, mean structure, but not at, certainly not anything in terms of covariance uh, structure. Okay, let's thank Kate again. And our next speaker is uh, Leon Tsai. She's going to tell us So before I start, I also wanted to advertise that uh, AM also have a lot of openness <laughs> for the uh, for the for the next couple of years. And especially we are um, interested in people doing Bayesian statistics, spatial statistics, and high dimensional data. So I already said that we want people uh, doing those uh, those kind of things. And also um, I, I won't tell a story, but I want to do uh, when I think about that, I think I can do um, you know, you watch, uh, you, you listen to that NPR, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me program, right? I was going to do a uh, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me Duke professor petition. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying, I don't know, you know, you know I'm bad at this, oh. but hopefully, you know, some, I, I really hope that uh, if you know the answer, you can speak it out loud, okay? Let's begin with simple words, just to warm up. 
So which professor? Uh, usually those questions are really relate to their uh, behaviors in the class. Because that's really how we know. <laughs> <laughs> sorry to those uh, postdoc alumni. Sorry. Um, OK, so which professor has a similar wardrobe like Steve Jobs? Instead of wearing blue jeans, he always wear black shirts and black uh, black uh, jeans to the class. <laughs> You know that. Well, so alumni is usually graduated. You know, you got a degree, you can say it, right? <laughs> okay. Yes. And uh, another question. You know, I, I'm sure you know who, uh, who, who that professor is. And this question is, who kind of students? Um, so does he still give candies during Halloween in the class? That's what he did to us. So he bring Halloween candies in the classroom. So that's not good. And another, this is about another professor. Okay, I'm going to do this. Why do professors do this in the classroom? Oh, you know, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, well, now I'm kind of exempted in the shoes are not on the desk because it's underneath the desk. I always, you know, I sit in a front row, I always have on these shoes. <laughs>
about the ozones, uh, the total column ozones. And we're looking at the uh, uh, level two data, which are irregular. And you can, maybe you can still see, uh, the color choice are not great, but it, perhaps you can still see the, the, the orbits of the, of, of the satellite. And uh, check the scale, the size of the data. It is, uh, uh, for a whole global coverage, it is uh, from 170,000 to a quarter meter. So that is considered as massive for spatial, for spatial data set. And you know, I guess well, if you check also those literatures on large spatial data sets, they, they claim that they can do with large data sets, but really the skill that they're talking about is about 10,000 or 20,000, not, not for this scale. And also, um, the state often, you know, if you look at, uh, look at the global data, they often show very strong non-stationarity. So we wanted to find a method that can reduce the computational cost and also can capture the non-stationary structure. <laughs> this is a motivation. And um, actually, I'm still following this. Uh, this uh, we which only look at, uh, so in this study, we only look at the spatial data. So for each day or for each cover, uh, global coverage, uh, we, we, we fit a spatial model on that. Um, but actually, more interestingly, we should look at the spatial temporal. But let's just, let me just begin with this, uh, with the, the, the univariate uh, spatial case. Um, so it's still, we, we use this Gauss, the univariate spatial Gaussian process regression as a you know, general framework to model such data. So here, y, your y's would just be the ozone measurements. And then uh, we could include the, some of the covariance information there. And then this WS is, uh, is, is modeled uh, using a Gaussian process with, uh, with a covariance function. And as I said, and actually, I, I hope I hope that you can also see from the picture that uh, clearly the common structure um, in the tropical area is very different uh, um, from the the current structures in the in the high latitude areas. So this is, there are, there are actually quite a few non-stationary parametric current functions out there, and actually I picked this one uh, for some reason. So I picked this particular one. This is a, a non stationary, I should put the reference here. So, this is a work done by uh, Chris Pesarek and his co authors. Um, this is a non stationary correlation function, it's defined in this way. Um, so, which have, so for location I, as i and as g, the correlation is, is determined by this uh, unit, this b is a, is a, is a two by two uh, matrix. And for a for two dimensional space, and it's a three by three matrix. It's, it's, it's a three dimensional matrix. Um, so this, this, this is sometimes it is termed as the, the kernel covariance matrix. Um, so it, it is in fact, uh, uh, or you know, if you if you if you use the, the Mahalanobis distance. So I, actually, I would rather call it the Mahalanobis uh, matrix. Okay. So just a. Uh, um, and so, so the entries in B are controlling the, the spatial range and the, the direction of that, the angles of that. Um, so if you look at this non-spatial correlation functions, if, or if, you know, if you just uh, focus on um, um, at location I, then it reduced. Or also, if you choose the row zero there to be, you know, like see on the term, then it reduced to a rect. To, to the common uh, stationary function. So here, row zero usually is uh, you can use the choose and return for that. Um, but you know, since the bi and the bj are, are di take different values at different locations, then you know you could, we could introduce our non stationarity there. And then the data likelihood you can write that down. Uh, and also, then the both the parameter estimation spatial prediction now involves a very thick matrix. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. So just a, a, a little bit of more details on that non-stationary correlation function. So see here, your Q, Q is the Mahalanobis distance. So it is defined uh, for, for across, across for, for, two, for two locations. Uh, this B takes the average of the BI plus the 
gift. Then here I just give you an example. You know, if you know we, we just consider two sets, two subregions, and and, uh, and also if we, we assume that within each subregion, this uh, things are spatial data are those covariant structures are stationary, then you have this matrix block block matrix. Okay, sigma one one. Sigma two, sigma one one only involves d y, sigma one. So d y that's a Mahalamudi's uh, matrix. Uh, and sigma sigma two two only involves b two. And your cross ones involve both d y and b two. So why it, it is actually a simple setup, but, but the reason that I like it is because see this allows you. So it has I mean the the commerce function is defined in the, at at the global scale, but if you look at uh, you know the look at the parameters, they have this uh, local parameters, so you can estimate because the, the data size is so large. Well, in fact, you can use you can use a global global. Ideally, you can you you, you want to use a global covariance uh, to estimate d one, uh, but to simplify the computation, we may just uh, look at the data in sub in each subregion and estimate this d one sigma one. Because those are, you know, it has a has a nice interpretation because there are local, just local covariance parameters. So it allows you to estimate local covariance parameters only using the data within each subregion. Is it kind of simple mathematics? Yeah, off diagonals. Does that make sense? Because this sort of stipulates that you've got that sort of breakdown. Uh huh. So can you then go check the relative to computation of these two same use and check to see if that non decomposition makes sense? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll go. We actually compare. So you have to. We in the simulation, we, we actually um, compare that. Uh, you know, this won't lose many things, especially if you have a large data set. So like within each subregion, you have a really, you still have a really dense, still have a really dense observation. So that helps you to to study the local parameters. And we showed that it, it actually, the of course you will lose something, but uh, it's still pretty accurate. Um, but there are still several questions left. <laughs> One is, um, you know, how to estimate local commerce parameters. The reason I'm putting it here is since uh, for for data like uh, for the data set, the global data like in our size, there are a quarter million in total. So see if you have 20, 20 or 25 partitions, you still end up with about 10,000 points there. So that's still considered as a large data. For a spatial Gaussian process model, you have a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix. That's not easy to to invert that. So how to how to estimate the local covariance parameter because you still end up with a lot of data. And then secondly, how to do the partition? How to partition the space? Um, and then third, we do not want. So you know, for local, I guess for parameter estimation, it's 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 a bit reasonable to 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 estimate those local parameters, but you know for prediction there you may have enough uh, uh, you may have some problems around the boundaries. Okay, so we still wanted to do some version of the global prediction. So, so in the global case, you want to allow that it's on the sphere. You're on the surface. Yes, it's on the sphere. So it's on the sphere. Actually, we are uh, here. The distance it's actually a three dimen in three dimensions. We do not use the spherical distance, or uh, the reason is uh, if you just use the, the greater circle distance, it cannot ensure the, the positive definiteness of the Gamma term. So that is uh, that is a, a, a result that is given by spatial energy in 2.6 or 2.4. Um, but if you use a so-called tunnel distance or shadow distance, it can ensure that. So we use a shadow distance. So the, actually, the, the, uh, in the real applications, the B is, is three by three dimension. Um, so let, let me just give you, um, so here is a, what I mean, a computational approximation approach that we have been working on for, for, for some time. Um, so I, we referred it to as a full scale approximation approach. The idea is um, we decompose, so given the Gaussian process, a spatial Gaussian process, we decompose it into two parts. So one is this large scale. Parts or we, we refer to the WLS, which is a reduced rank part. Then plus a WS is a sparse, sparse part. Uh, the reason that we do this is, um, you know, I actually I had this work when I was a graduate student at Duke. I, I was involved in this work with Alan on predictive process, which is a reduced rank type of approach. But I actually found that uh, 
reduced run type approach, it just couldn't capture the small scale very well. So we just, then in this work, it kind of motivates me to, to find a way to, to correct those, the small scale errors. Okay? So that is how I got, uh, got this idea. Uh, then, you know, if the first part is a reduced run, and the second part is a, a small scale, then the, if we, then the covariance matrix that can be decomposed, also decomposed in this way, only involves a by M, and by M matrix, and, and then by M matrix. And also the, then the second part is a sparse matrix. Okay, now let, let me just tell you how I specify um, the reduced rank part. And sparse so, excuse part. me, today, do you use the orthogonality of the residues? Yes, actually, it's orthogonal if you use predictive process. And that's a nice property about the predictive process. So, if you just use other reduced rank, like spline, using spline basis, truncated case spline, or others, it does not ensure if you use C minus the original parent or last mindset, it, it's not orthogonal. But if you're using predictive process, it is orthogonal. Because the predictive process is defining this way. So, you begin with a set of knots, M knots, and then you know, then you define that this W star is to be a, a, a random vector, is a, is a low dimensional random vector, which is if you know the, the, the original. So we, we always begin with a, a original Gaussian process with a non, you know, with a given uh, covariance function. And then you have this W star, this low, low rank random vector, and then you project everything. So project the original WS, the Gaussian process, onto the space that is spanned by this low rank. Uh, vector, then that is the one that you get. So this, is, if you if you if you took the Allen special class, you should realize that this is just the, the gradient mean, okay? And that doesn't introduce any extra uh, parameters in that. So as uh, as long as you have the knots, it doesn't introduce any, and also it is optimal in the sense that it will minimize the vector, uh, uh, and minimize the linear square error. And so the covariance function takes this form, so that C. And C inverse C. So that's only involves M by M matrix. And why it is a, now you can see why it is orthogonal. Because C minus this part. So this is this is also, you know, just the, the conditional conditional covariance, right? So C minus uh, C minus gives you the conditional covariance. That is still a positive definite one. It's orthogonal. And um, it is referred to as a predicate process because this is a, uh, it's highly related, it's closely related to the quick and mean, and also it is related to the nice strong approximation for the component of expansion, which is just an orthogonal expansion of the Gaussian process. So you can use this method, so it has a very nice theoretical property. So you can use it as an approximation to the um, to the truncated uh, eigen uh, eigen eigen expansions. Okay. Um, and it applies to any given commerce functions. You know, for any given ones, you have this form without introducing any parameters. And uh, one more advantage, I just said that it is also that's very important. Because then, now if you look at C minus the first part, it's still positive definite, but now it has a much smaller, uh, smaller scale dependence than the original ones. You know, there are actually, uh, for the for large spatial data set, a, a class of models are uh, assuming sparse structures for the covariance. But this may not be true in practice because you know, we do not really know that the true spatial dependence is at a really short range. But if you look at this one, this becomes a conditional covariance. Then it makes, makes, more, uh, makes much more sense to assume that this, this, is at a, this has a sparse structure. Then you, then you are safe, kind of a relative to, uh, to, to use you know, some sort of a, uh, approximation approach that is suitable for small scale structures. So one is blocking, because then you you know you just uh, take k to be the, the blocks, and then just uh, keep all the block diagonals. And then the second approach is uh, you know use covariance tapering. But of course you know if things are really highly non-stationary, you may want some adaptive system or blocking approach to do that. And here, just to give you a graphical illustration, so here is the original one, so the true covariance looks like this. If you use a reduced run uh, in specific, the predictive process covariance, you can see it does a pretty good job, but actually, if you take the difference, you can see that there's still problems. It couldn't, those are the errors. But now, and also, I hope, hope, I hope now, you from this figure, you're convinced that the, the small part, you know, the residual part has a much smaller scale. Then, you know, just think about, you know, if you use block, you know, here another block, or use taper, it gives you a much better result. And here, you know, just maybe just look at the last one. 
So the, in the here, I show the exponential covariance functions, and then those are the, the that is a true covariance, and those red dots are the covariance given by the two scale information. Very, very close to the truth. Okay, so it, ha uh, it, in it inherit very um, many nice properties from the predictive process. It's, it's still, it has a, you know, it also applies to any given covariance functions without introducing extra parameters. And because it's a still a Gaussian process and a valid covariance function, you know, it has a lot of applications now. It can be applied to univariate and non-station and multivariate. Actually, um, we have done the univariate and multivariate case, and uh, non-stationary one is under revision. And spatial temporal student is working on that. Okay, um, I'll skip this. Um, okay, for the computation, then maybe you're, if you're wondering why a reduced rank of plus plus give you computational uh, savings, the reason is you know if you apply the sherman woodbury formula on the inversion of you know a reduced rank plus a sparse matrix, then the inversion will only involve the inverse of an m by m matrix and um, a sparse matrix, which you can handle easily in sparse uh, sparse uh, matrix technique. Okay, and uh, let me move to the space partition. How to uh, partition the space? Actually, I, I think uh, when I think about this, I remember that's a, another nice thing about Duke. We always invited uh, many good speakers. So I, I, I remember when I was a grad student, Herbie Lee was invited to give a talk on this tree Gaussian process. Then I thought hey, that could be a good idea, you know, to to be used here. Because then you know we, we can let the data tell us where the partition is. So we could use, well, uh, we actually borrowed this idea to the tree the generating models to partition the input space. Um, so let me show you this. For some reason, I have a I couldn't. Uh, yeah, it's not healthy enough. Okay. There's supposed to be a thing. <laughs> so where you can see a tree, actually, a binary tree is is corresponding to a space partition. Okay. So if you consider a binary tree like at a, at this dimension and make a split, it means that you make a split in in, in this uh, maybe uh, along the direction of the longitude. Then then if the, in the next step you make a further split, it means that the further splits in, in the second dimension it means that uh, you can uh, make a make another partition that will be along the latitude direction. Okay. So, um, so we can, I don't understand. What is the objective behind? I know you have to partition, but what's the criteria at final maximum? As a target of the variance, variance of the estimate, or computational efficiency? If you're partitioning. You mean for partition? Yeah. Because you want the partition to give you, because we, we still kind of assume like within each partition, things are stationary. So you want to you want the letter used in this tree model to, te to tell you which region is stationary. So you want to partition the non-stationary field so that uh, you know locally they have a stationary uh, feature. But that's the motivation. But, but isn't it strongly believing in the model? How do you account for the uncertainty that your model is not? So you partition. So you choose to partition based on the fact that you assume stationarity, and you want to find stationarity. Yes. Well, yeah. So that's true. We we kind of begin with this non the, the non-stationary models that I just used to find. Another question. Okay. Uh, so you maybe in binary, so in each step, do you have any reason for which direction you want to position the longitude? Or that? I'll, I'll get to that. In, in fact, for this uh, for this study, you know, if you're you have some experience with, um, uh, I mean, for this particular application, if you have some experience with the ozone data or global ozone data, the m most of the non-stationarity is coming from the latitude instead of long longitude. So basically you expect that the tropical behavior is quite different with high latitude. But if you if you if you consider maybe Indonesia with some areas in Caribbean, I don't know, then there, there might not be a big difference if you are within the similar latitude band. So we, in this case actually we only do uh, in one dimension. Um, so this binary tree that consists of internal nodes and terminal nodes. So the, basically, those each terminal nodes will just uh, is associated with uh, with the subregion. Um, so then a tree just partitions the input space by splitting each internal node according to a splitting rule. So basically, what it does, it, a tree, what tree does that it has to tell you, um, you know, how many how many subregions that you need, and also uh, you, the splitting rule is basically uh, basically. Uh, 
the one that you know, determines where to where to select or which dimension to select if the dimension is higher than one. Okay, and so you you need to put priors on those those things. So one is weighting probability. So uh, the the probability of this, of a partition that space into two is uh, is usually we just follow the similar ones that are given in 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 the previous literature where you know this A and Z controls the, the, the shape of the size of the tree. And also you have, we have need to put a uh, rule uh, put prior on the splitting rules. Basically, you know you have to determine which dimension or where to split. But usually people just use a time limit on the splitting dimension specifications. So that go back to the question if you have two of it's just treated. Um, all right, so then, you know, condition on the tree, we just update uh, all the other parameters in a similar way. Um, but remember, we use a full scale approximation there to speed up the computation. And then we sample tree the partitions following those rule from change in the rotation operations. Um, but uh, I have to admit that there, uh, just in case someone on my reviewers. Uh, so uh, uh, over there, um, we didn't really do uh, the, the, the most optimized way. We, 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 so because in the original ones, those many parameters are, are, are marginalized out. But for this, we, we didn't do it. We just follow, we didn't really marginalize everything out. Um, OK. And lastly, you know, how to do global prediction. Oh, here are just a few lines that hopefully you can get the idea. So what do we do? We, we still want to do global uh, prediction in, in the reason that, you know, if condition just a condition on, on the tree, if you just do local prediction, you will have some discontinuous along the boundary. But, you know, if we consider it this way, so what, what I, I, I was thinking of doing is, you know, still, I have a global coherence. So I should use it some way. So I have this global coherence, but I cannot use it directly. So what I do is I apply this taper. I apply taper first on that. Because, but this taper range now can be relatively large. Because I, I just use it as a first step. So basically I have a two step approach. I have two types of approximation. So taper the global one first. Because that makes sense. You don't expect a much difference for a point that's a thousand miles away, right? So you can, you can be a conservative in choosing your taper range. So that the first step will give you a pretty good approximation. And then you apply the full scale to the taper version. So that's what we do, and it, it seems to work pretty well. And in a simulation study, we just do uh, you know two partitions, um, you know with two 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 regions that have a very distinct uh, uh, <coughs> distinct uh, covariance structures, and we kept out some, especially um, the points close to the boundary to assess the prediction performance. And now. So now just uh, let me be, be honest. So, so here we used two types of approximations, right? One, you want to, to know whether, go back to Natasha's question, so is lo can, can we use local, uh, can we use local, local, uh, local fitting to estimate the, the parameters, to, to estimate the local current parameters in that, instead of uh, you know, using the whole? Because, I, oh sorry, it's, uh, it's Richard's question. And it's because the, 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 the the local parameters are also involved, you know, in the opt-out. So you wanted to see that. And secondly, you want to see, you know, because I apply this full scale coherence approximation, you want to see how that how well that works. And here's the result. So the first one, maybe you can concentrate just on the prediction performance. So this is the pre predictive error given by the full model. So for this we are able to calculate that. And this one is like a separate FSA. So basically that's what we did. So this value is like what we did. So Two kind of, we use local fitting, we use um, full scale approximation. And this one is a joint FA, FSA, is a, is a value that we, we use global fitting to estimate local parameters and we use uh, the full scale approximation. As you can see, the difference between those two are very minimal. Okay? The difference is very is minimal, which kind of uh, tells us that this local fitting really works. And also, then you compare those two. So of course, you know, well, I mean, the prediction error is a bit larger than the one that considering the computational benefits. I don't think that's a, that's a big difference. Okay. Uh, well, and also we applied it with the reduced random type of approach, and our our uh, predictions are here close to the truth, and those are the reduced random. Um, okay. 
Now let me move to the, the true application. Let's say it takes a while. I did it intentionally because you know it's, it's a large data set. It needs some time to load. This is the Tom's also level two data. Let's go back to that. And um, oh, let me tell you the motivation again. So we actually the goal here is not just the uh, for ground estimation. In fact, in the end, your your product is to uh, to create a level three data, which you know the data are interpolated at a regular points so that the people and the users, like the climate scientists or environmental scientists, they can download this from their website and they can they can use that for their purpose. Okay, so they would prefer regular data. And this is the result that we got. But here I just plotted the the, the, the MAP. So here I just show you the MAP posterior about the tree. So this kind of that's how the space is partitioned, um, and also the interpolating the values. Um, yeah, so basically you can see a, a lot of non-stationarities going on near the pole because actually also it is the case that there is a lot in around the tropical seas are are relatively more stable. All right, so I will wrap up. Um, so here I introduce a. Uh, uh, a computer, I think of a, a, a computational uh, physical models for massive non-stationary data, water relay. So we use a non-stationary covariance model to, to for allows for local dating. Of course, we can we can use other you know global non-stationary covariance models like those ones that are developed by my colleague Nikhil and also his uh, her her wife and Michael Stein. Um, but this gives you extra computational benefits. And we use tree generating process to partition the space and to seal it and to work for a while. And there are several ongoing works, you know, now some table interaction, we're working on that, adaptive uh, tapering functions or blocking functions. And especially, you know, the nice thing about this is if we can make it uh, uh, in parallel competition, it will be really fast. Okay, now I open any questions. Of questions, we've got time for maybe one while uh, our next speaker gets started. Well, you just didn't say anything about uh, the priors for the Bs. Priors for the Bs. Uh, B is the, uh, the first. Okay, so we've actually been dealing with the small ones because we do not really want to manage the actual B matrices themselves, you just modify them. Okay, and our, uh, our final speaker of the session is Veronica. Um, Went from the University of Michigan, and she's going to talk about a generalized class of traditionally autoregressive models. Uh, so, first of all, I think that this is a not that one very difficult um, act to follow. So, I also don't have an entertaining, I think, story about you. But what I can say is, when I came to interview, I had a great visit with Alan and the students, and I was, as at the end of the interview, I was completely sure that I wanted to come here, but. You know, you get all these advices when you go for interview that they always start to try to look like hard to get. And so I was really trying to hold myself and not say, yes, I want to come here. And so I was always being very vague when the students were asking me, so are you coming? I was trying to bite my tongue and say, I don't know, I don't know, even though I already knew. And then I went back home and I drafted this email for Adam to say, yes, I want to take the postdoc position. but. I hold back, and every day I was thinking, I should send it, no, you should not, you should wait, you should wait <laughs> to look hard to get, and finally, I think I resisted three days, and finally I sent it again. <laughs> and that was, um, it was a great decision, I really had a good time here at Duke, and I had many good friends, and I found that the Duke alumni network is really strong. Every time I go to conferences, if I meet somebody that knows that I've been at Duke, I immediately become a Duke and a friend, so it's great. So thank you very much for building this great department. Um, so what I'm presenting today is one of the most recent projects that I've been working with Adam. Um, and it's a project that has been giving us a lot of joys. <laughs> um, so I realized that, that probably you all know um, the topic I'm going to cover in the introduction. 
So differently from what Julian and um, Kate have talked about, I'm talking about spatial data, but I'm not talking about a spatial process, but I'm talking about what we said called a rather arbitrary system where we have a finite number of aerial units, and at each aerial unit we have associated a univariate random variable. So we to introduced this class of, of models that have been having a wide application in very disparate uh, fields, from disease mapping to agricultural trials. And so what we will, the notation that we will use, we have n sites, and each of these sites is represented, each of, we have n units, and each of these units is represented by a site that can be the centroid of any representative site, we call that SI. And at each unit we have an associated random variable yi. So since we have spatial data and we want to introduce some spatial dependence, we should provide a joint distribution. And the major contribution of this sub paper was that instead of specifying a joint distribution, he provided a local specification of this joint distribution through a set of full conditionals. And so if you're working with, um, for example, for, with normal data, the full conditional distributions are the distribution of yi given all the rest is normal with a mean that is the weighted average of the observation at the neighboring sites and a variance that is inversely proportional to the sum of the weights at the neighbors. So you can see that this is a, an obvious model that can be used to do smoothing because if you're doing smoothing, you're probably replacing the value of the unit with the average of the neighbors. Um, so from this set of full conditional that you can derive through um, Brooks lemma the associated joint distribution, which in this case is a distribution that is the mini set of the multivariate normal distribution. But you can see here that the precision matrix is, in this case, given by dw minus w, where the D matrix dw is a diagonal matrix that has as elements the sum of the weights of the neighbors. The matrix w is the matrix of weights. And so the precision matrix in this case is row stochastic, and so the distribution, the joint distribution that is implied by that set of full conditional is improper. And so it cannot be used as a prior distribution for the data. So you can see here that the spatial dependence in the data is completely introduced by the set of weights, the WIJ. So what are classical choices for the weights? So classically, we use binary weights, one if two area units are uh, neighbors on zero otherwise. Other choices would be to use ways that are inversely proportional to the distance of the centroids of the area units. But um, there has been recently some work to try to allow this class of conditionally autoregressive models to be more flexible. And so a lot of the work actually has been done by people that are located in, in this region. So there is Brian Reed who worked on extending the class of traditional autoregressive model for dental data. So that's a strange application of spatial statistics. Um, and then Sujit Ghosh, with some of his students, also worked on extending the class of traditional autoregressive model. And this is also something that I've always heard that Chiranjit has worked on extension of the um, SAR models which are related to the, which are closely related to the conditional autoregressive model, but I've never seen its work. So I put the reference, but one day hopefully I will see that paper and I can talk about that. Um, so what we thought to do here was to try to extend the conditional autoregressive model and instead of having fixed weights, we want the weights to be random. And so our idea was that if we have the weights to be random, we can also learn about some sort of directionality in the spatial dependence. And so we try to come up with a way to construct weights that are random. And so this is how we went about it. We introduced a latent spatial process, QS, which we assume is stationary, has mean zero variance one, and has a covariance function that depends on a parameter vector phi. Then we define the new set of weights, W tilde IJ, to be related to the binary adjacent weight WIJ because we want to respect the geography of the spatial region that we have in front of us. But we modify this weight WIJ with a function G. So since this weight WIJ should be symmetric, 
and should reflect some sort of relationship between the area of the units i and j, the function g should be applied to something that relates the process at area i and the process at area j. So the function g will be some, some sort of, will be dependent on the relationship between qsi and qsj. And the function g uh, should be a positive function because the weight should be positive. So when you first look at this, you think, oh, there are many choices of function g that I can take. And it turns out, this is where we had all this choice, that the function g actually cannot be anything. And so after a lot of attempts and uh, trial and errors and thinking about the theory behind it, we chose as function g the following. So we have 1 plus the square difference of this hidden process at si and sj normalized by gamma si minus sj, which gamma si minus sj is basically the variogram of the process q. And so with this definition of the function j, this new set of, of weights, adjacency weight wt by j, are basically the same as the original weights wij modified by this increment that is due to the difference, the square difference of the process q at the two aerial units. So you can see that we are not making aerial units to be adjacent if they are not from the um, topography. Also, you can see that if the process q is um, degenerate, we get the original binary weight. And also, if you try to come up with an interpretation of what this function q is, you can think about as the gradient, um, as the difference between qsi and qsj increases, then also the weight increase. So the weight is some sort of a reflection of the gradient in the later process q. So after we have defined the um, weight, w tilde i j, basically everything remains as in the classical class of conditional regressive models. So Again, we say condition on the vector q, um, the conditional distribution of yi given the rest and given q is just basically what the same form that we have in the classical time model. The only thing that is that we are replacing the binary adjacency weight with this new class of weights. And so it follows naturally that then also the joint distribution is going to be the same as before and it's going to be improper. Okay? So, um, also, because of the form that we chose for this set of weights, we can derive all sorts of distributional properties for the weights. So we can figure out what is the marginal distribution of the weights, we can figure out what's the expected value of the weights, what's the variance of the weights, and we can also look at what is the correlation between two set of weights that are assigned to two area units that are neighbor to the same area unit I. So we can derive the form of the covariance between the weights that, uh, that measure the spatial dependence between area unit i and j, and the weights that measure basically the spatial dependence between area unit i and k. Um, so because the joint distribution is also in this case um, improper, we cannot use this class of model as a prior for the data, but we can, as a model for the data, but we can only use it as a prior for the spatial random effects. And so the model that we envision is the following. We have data at area units. We will express the data, the observation at, looking at area units i as the sum of an overall mean plus the spatial random effects plus an error term. And when we provide the spatial random effects with a generalized star prior. And so basically this is the full Bayesian hierarchical model that we have. Um, and then we have this latent process Q, which we said since we're working only with n area units, we have a random vector q, which depends on the covariance parameter phi, and we have a multivariate normal distribution with mean zero and a correlation matrix out of phi. And then we complete the specification of the model with priors on all the remaining parameters. So if you want to do inference for this class of model, actually, everything is, um, all the full conditions are available in closed form. The only full condition that is not available in closed form is the one for the covariance parameter. So we can do inference by doing all the sampling algorithm. And we can also derive what is the um, full conditional distribution 
of the spatial random effects condition on the latent process queue and the data. We can figure out also what is the full conditional distribution of this um, latent vector queue. And we can also figure out what is the marginal distribution of the um, vector of random effect when we integrate out the, um, the, the latent vector Q. And also in this case, we have that it's an improper distribution. So we have all sorts of nice distributional results. So once we have figured out all the theory, we wanted to actually check if this model was working. So we said that this model is an extension of the classical car model. So we wanted to see if it would be possible if we had a data that was originated under a car model to actually recover the weights that we have under the classical car model. And so what we did is we simulated 10 independent data sets according to the model that I showed you before, where the spatial random effects in one case were provided with a classical car prior, in the second case they were provided with a generalized car prior, and we assumed that the latent process Q had an exponential correlation function. And so what we wanted to see is if the data was originated under a car prior, is it possible and we fit the generalized car prior, it's actually possible to um, recover weights, the W tilde IJ, normalized weights that are the same as we had under the car prior. So when we're simulating under a car model, we made simulation assuming that the mean, the overall mean was five and the uh, variance of the noise was 0.2 and the spatial variance was 0.5 and you can see that whether we fit the car model or generalized car model we can recover the true parameters very well and if we look at 90% credible intervals we see that we have pretty much good coverage under each model and we can also look at the spatial random effects and compare the posterior mean of the spatial random effects with the true value and see if which of these two models is performing better, and the difference is very small, is in the fourth decimal digit. Okay, so when we're simulating uh, data under a car model, this is the spatial dependence structure that we assume for the spatial random effects, and so you can see that the spatial random, the spatial dependence comes through this normalized way. And so we have simulated data on a lattice, so each area of units has either two, three, or four neighbors. And so this normalized weight would either be one half, one third, or one fourth. And so this is the distribution of the weights under that we use to make the simulation. So you see there is like one third, one fourth, one third, and one half. Okay, so we fit the model to this data that we simulate under a car model. If we fit our generalized star model, we get the estimates of these weights, W tilde IJ. These weights now can be from one, can be positive um, values. So what we're looking now is the normalized weights. And we're comparing the posterior mean of the normalized weight and see if we have basically a shape that is similar to the one that we have under the car model. And we can see that we recover that histogram. Okay? So we can do the same thing for this variance, the conditional variance of square over WI plus, so this is the, the true data, the histogram of the conditional variances, and this is the posterior mean that we get when we fit the generalized R model to the simulated data. Then we do the opposite exercise. Now we simulate data on the generalized R model, and we fit both the car model and the generalized R model, and we want to see if we do a good job at estimating all the parameters. And so if the data is simulated under a generalized car model, which means the weights are not one half, one third, and one fourth, the car model tends to underestimate the spatial variance. Okay? While instead we can recover basically almost all parameters if we fit the true model that we use to simulate the data. We have some trouble estimating the parameters that encode the spatial dependence in the latent process, but that's basically um, it's a common problem in spatial statistics. So also if you look at the coverage of the competency, so where we have good empirical coverage, again, we have bad, somewhat of a worse result for the decay parameter. And if we look at the estimate of the spatial random effects, we have again that uh, the, the performance of the two models is very similar, but the generalized term model gives a slightly better performance. So again, we can look in terms of the weights. 
So we have simulated data on the generalized curve model. So this is the histogram of the normalized weights that we have used to generate our data. And this is the histogram of the posterior mean of the normalized weights when we fit the generalized curve model to the data. So you can see that we actually are capable to recover the true distribution of the weights. If you were fitting a curve model to this data, the estimates of your, you didn't have to estimate the weights, so you will only have a peak at 0 0.33, 0 0.5, and 0.25, okay? So same thing for the conditional variances. You see that we are um, doing a good job at recovering the true parameters. So now one question that can be raised here is, so we have moved from a model that only depended on one parameter, the spatial variance, to a model that introduced a latent process. Um, another characteristic of this CAM model is that they're usually they're sometimes used to re reduce dimensionality problems. Because instead of working with joint distribution, we're working with um, local, the local specification. So here one could say, now you're again back into the problem of large data if you have a large number of area units, because you're introducing this latent process queue upon which you want to make inference. And so we might suffer with the big, of, um, we might suffer from the big end problem. So we need to find a way to alleviate this problem in case of large data set. And so what we thought of is to use the kernel convolution approach of Higdon and all, but it can also be, uh, we can also use the predictive process approach. So in the kernel convolution approach, the idea is that you can always generate a stationary process Yx by taking white noise process and convolving it with some kernel function k. So Yx will be given by this integral. We can approximate then Yx through this finite sum where we have selected the number of location and the location themselves, Tf. Okay, so this is what we do in our generalized term model. If we have a large number of area units, instead of working with the latent process Qs, we're working with Q tilde S. Okay, and so now the weights are gonna be defined as before, but we're replacing the QSI and the QSJ with the Q tilde SI and the Q tilde SJ, and we are replacing the variogram with the variogram for this um, approximation. Okay, and so the application. So one application of this class of generalized star model is in disease mapping. People in special epidemiology use star models a lot. In fact, if you go to a um, special epidemiology conference, you will hear this disease mapping model over and over. So in disease mapping, the interest is in trying to make maps of the incidence of the rates of a disease. And so usually what you have is you have the observed number of cases of a disease over a region, and then you have the expected number of cases that is being calculated through some sort of um, standardization. And so you want to make uh, a map of actually the relative, the log relative risk of contracting the disease in region I. And so the classical disease mapping model says that the observed number of cases of the disease conditional on this relative risk is Poisson with the relative risk and with the parameter that is the product of the relative risk times the expected number of cases in the region. And then in a disease mapping model, usually you're trying to relate the log relative risk to certain covariance covariates, and then you add some random effects to account for spatial variation. And so here is what we propose is that instead of providing these spatial random effects with a car prior, we suggest that a good idea would be to estimate, to provide these spatial random effects with the generalized car prior. So we apply this model to a classical data set, which is the lip cancer data. So here we have incidence of cases, number of cases of lip cancer in Scotland between 1975 and 1980. And so you can see that there is some um, regions in Scotland where there is a higher number of uh, lip cancer cases, and that's in the eastern part of the region. So we want to fit the disease mapping model to this data, 
and the provided information that is available for this data set is the percentage of population that is engaged in agricultural fishing or forestry in that county. And so we fit both disease mapping model where we use the two different priors for the spatial random effects. And under both models, we get the same estimates for the covariates, and which um, was somewhat reassuring. Um, and so in particular, what we saw was that there is a, an increased risk of lip cancer in counties where there is a larger percentage of people that are involved in agricultural fishing or forestry. And this is the map that shows the percentage of the population that is dedicated to those activities. And so you can see that there is a high percentage here where we also observed before the highest number of uh, cases. So as I said, we fit both models to the data and we get two estimates of the spatial random effects. So this is the estimate, the map of the estimates of the spatial random effects when we fit the car model to the data and when we fit the generalized car model. Red means positive random effects and blue means negative random effects. So when we use weights that are not fixed a priori but are random, we see that the main difference is that in this corner here of the region, the spatial random effects pass from being positive to negative. Okay, um, but if you look at this map, sometimes it's hard to quantify the difference. So we also look at a map that just looks at the difference between the, the random effects. And so again, you see white means so basically there is no difference between these um, estimates of the random effects. Positive means that the generalized CAR model was given larger estimates of the spatial random effects, and blue means that. Um, the generalized star model was, provide, was providing smaller estimates of the spatial random effects. So I started by saying that the CAR model is used often to smooth spatial data. So what we might be interested in doing is assessing the level of smoothing that this class of model provides over the classical CAR model. So what we can do to, us, to, compa to compare the smoothing is to, for example, make map of the raw data, which is here. So this is the observed number of cases of lip cancer. This is the expected number of cases of lip cancer according to the current model. And this is the expected number of cancer according to the generalized current model. And so you can see, and then you can, what you can do is you compare by eye, basically, this maps to the raw data. And the model that will provide the less amount of smoothing is the model that gives a map that is closer to the observation. So instead of doing the assessment by eye, we actually computed numerical summaries to, com to compare the amount of smoothing. And for this, it's actually hard to say, right? Um, you don't know what is a good amount of smoothing. If you smooth too much, maybe you create a map where there is a uniform color. If you smooth too little, you have a map that is the same as the observed. So we compute the mean square average smooth, which is basically the difference, the square, the, the average of the square differences between the observation and the expected, the fit accounts, and the mean absolute error for the smoothing. And so here is a question for you: Which of these two models do you think will provide the greater amount of smoothing? Good question. Is that uh, done excluding that particular observation from the, the fitting, or you do that? No, I'm not excluding any observation. So you, you're not doing any. It's not like a predictive that. noise. Yeah. So which mo which of the two models do you think it provides the um, greater amount of smoothing? No, 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 they are not. So this is the raw data. These are the fitted counts under the two models. So they are not supposed to look exactly the same because these two models have different. And it is a little different. You don't see it. But for example, here there is a white region. So there is no case. But uh, because you are smoothing, in both pictures they get to be light purple. And in the car model, this is actually a little bit darker. And in the generalized car model, it's lighter. Are these, uh, these actual counts, or is there like a per capita rate? No, those are counts. <coughs> I think. Uh, if they're rates, I'm just worried that 
smaller county if you're a bit more varied. Anyway. Yeah, well, which is why you want to do this type of modeling, right? Um, but even then, the sample size is so small. Even the cancers are there, the sample size mm -hmm. is small. The variance is small. You'll have only signal from samples that are relatively large. Yeah, like the small counties are fishing yeah. agriculture counties, and maybe just to keep the small counties really more variable. If it's a rate, I bet if it's a count. Right? No, it's a count. Okay, so um, so yes, the the answer is that in fact the gen generalized curve models moves the data less, and in fact that's what we obtain that the mean square error smoothing is, and the mean absolute error smoothing are small are smaller for the generalized curve model than for the curve model, which means that our feeder counts are going to be closer to the observations. So is, is that because the, the weight between any two points is always greater than the, your model? So when you do the curve model, the intuition is that you're giving equal weights to all the neighbors. Right. In our model, we are not, right? So you might have that some regions have larger weights, so you're... you're always larger. Always larger, um, not necessarily. Yeah. Okay, so the other thing that you could do is you could look, because in our case the normalized weights are random, we could look at these normalized weights and use them to do one which is um, some, some um, things that geographers like to do. So I will leave it like that. <laughs> So the conclusion is that we have presented we <laughs> a more general class of conditional regression model. The main contribution is that now the weights are not determined a priori, but they are random, they are directional. Um, as I said, our struggle was a lot with determining what these three functions should be. We played with many different functions and some choices led to uh, distributions that were not valid distributions and so by thinking hard, we realize that the function g has to be an increasing function. And so um, our choice of the g function actually led to nice distributional properties. And we were able to derive all the full conditions across four. Uh, as I said, by doing this um, class of generalized condition and autoregressive model, we're adding a extra layer to our model. And that can be problematic when you have a large number of um, LL units. And we try to accommodate um, a large dimensionality via kernel convolution. And we saw that um, when we present it as an application, this is nothing. Time for one or two more questions. Um, I might have seen it. So I think in that case, though, they um, they don't use the geography, right? You can establish a link between regions that are not adjacent, if I'm right. Yeah, I mean, you put in the efficiency. Right? Yeah, so. Yeah, and then you would end up with random weights. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's another another way to do it. Neither way, I think. But you wouldn't have directionality. Yeah, so I, I, I think I've seen the talk once, and that's. Function, so you can think of it. The Q function is a leading process and has a covariance function that depends on distance. Did you think about so Yeah, so we thought about that, but then so what you should what you would need to do in that case is you would need to specify a proper car model for the Q process, right? And so, well, I am, I would rather, rather prefer a Gaussian process than a proper car model. Also because 
sometimes I introduce some strange correlation among sites when you work with proper car models. And so that's why we went with the Gaussian process. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, let's thank all three of the speakers.